Dr. Faber, in the September issue of the Gloom, Boom and Doom report, you said that the future will be a total disaster with a collapse of our capitalistic system as we know it. Three months later, do you still stand by that assessment or did you underestimate the power of the governments to shore up the global economy? Well, I think that, you know, we had this huge intervention in the world but if you look at the cause of the financial crisis, the cause of the financial crisis was excessive credit growth. And essentially the private sector has reacted rationally. After 2008, the private sector has reduced its leverage. In other words, consumer credit is declining and business credit is also declining, but this is being offset by a huge expansion of government credit. So total credit as a percent of the economy in the U.S. is still growing. Now, officially, debt to GDP is 375%. It was 186% when uh, the U.S. went into depression after 1929. In other words, we start with a much higher debt level. In 1929, we didn't have Social Security and we didn't have Medicare and Medicaid. If you add these unfunded liabilities of Medicare and Medicaid, and if you add Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that have been taken over by the government, we're talking about the debt to GDP of over 600%. In my opinion, in the long run, this is not sustainable. Something will give and they'll have to print money and the fiscal deficits will go up and the problem will be one day that when interest rates go up for whatever reason and maybe next year or in three years time the interest payments on the government debt will balloon and in say seven years time the interest payments on the US government debt will be between 35 to 50 percent of tax revenues then you are in a huge mess and so I believe that to get out of this mess they will monetize and they'll have all kinds of stimulus packages and they will lead to high inflation and the standards of living of the typical household the average household will go down and it will enrich a few people the elite essentially on Wall Street but then to distract the attention the US will uh, escalate its war efforts and then we'll go into war in the world and then the whole thing will collapse. But you know it can be in 10 years time, could be in 5 years time, could be in 3 years time, could be 12 years time, who knows. But that is essentially my long term very negative view. Now as an investor you can't sit there and say then I don't do anything at all because by being in cash you have zero interest. So you have to do something and so I think that equities are probably a better place to hide than government bonds. You've also said that somewhere in the future there will be a war and during war times commodity prices go up sharply. Don't you think the threat of war is exaggerated uh, given that nations have shown considerable restraint in international relations during this recession? Well, well I think the interests of the US and China are further apart than ever before because you have a essentially declining superpower the United States and you have a rising superpower China and uh, the current superpower the US will obviously try to contain the rise of China and China will want to have more say in global affairs and you can see their expansion everywhere in Latin America, in the Middle East, uh, even in the Indian Ocean, in uh, East Africa and so forth. So that will lead to tensions in my opinion. And we are at war. We are at war essentially in Iraq and we are at war in Afghanistan, Pakistan and these are war wars, in my opinion, where there's no solution. It's not going to go away. away. It's, it's, it will escalate over time. So does one then assume that you are still not very optimistic when it comes to the US economy or the markets? Well basically the problem of the United States is that it doesn't produce enough compared to the whole economy 
and that its net savings are very low. In other words, if you have two countries, or let's put it more in more simple terms, you have two households or two businesses. One household spends everything it earns. One company spends everything it earns, and pays out in dividends, and borrows money to maintain the lifestyle of the owners or the family to buy a car, to buy a house, to buy appliances, mobile phones, and so forth. The other household or the other company, on the other hand, out of its earnings puts something aside and invests in education or in terms of a company, in research and development or in new plants and in new machinery and so forth. Who do you think in the long run will be better off? Consuming means exactly what the word says. Consumption is you have a plate of food in front of you. You consume it, then the food is gone. And saving is to put it part of the food aside for the winter time or for, for emergencies. And so, in my opinion, the U.S. has badly abused its power to borrow money, basically, and has not saved at all in the last few years. And when you continuously dissave, then obviously in the long run, relatively speaking, your standards of living go down compared to countries like China and India where you have a high savings rate and where people then build factories and develop their infrastructure and develop the educational standards and so forth and so on. So if you look at 1950, the US is up here and emerging economies are down here. And now the US is still up here, but it's not up much. And emerging economies, they've closed the gap. There's still a gap uh, between the US and most emerging economies. But you look at ed educational standards in the US. In many states of the US, 20% of the people are illiterate. You know, this is, I mean, horrible.